You've heard about rolling coal, blasting diesel smoke out of a truck exhaust like a shoe factory of the 1890s? Sure, it's fun for a while, but do you need all that smoke? Hello, I'm Gail Banks. We're here at Banks Power, a uh, com company I've been running since 1958. Uh, it's all under the umbrella of Gail Banks Engineering, which is a engine, a tier one engine supplier. Uh, first, we started back in the 50s and 60s supplying engines to boat builders, and more recently, engines to build uh, military uh, boats and also uh, vehicles. We're gonna talk about diesel today. And diesel is not a new idea. Diesel has been around since the 1890s. Uh, Rudolf Diesel got his first engine going about in that time frame. It's a four-stroke engine, which was invented about 20 years earlier uh, and, and productionized by a fellow named Nicholas Otto. So what we're talking about is an engine that has four movements of the piston, uh, suck, squeeze, bang, blow, or you know, intake, compression, combustion, and exhaust. What you do in an engine is you mix pounds of air with pounds of fuel. It's called air-fuel ratio. If you want to make more power and you want the engine, your diesel engine, to live, you can't just add fuel and build smoke. Yeah, you'll get some power, but you're putting the engine on kill. So the air's got to be there, and more specifically, the air density, pounds of air per cubic foot. The engine pumps cubic feet per minute. We want each cubic foot to have more air molecules in it, so to speak. In the case of a diesel, the engine's fire is lit just by the heat of compressing the air uh, and injecting the diesel fuel into it. That lights it off. In the early years, it was mechanically controlled, and more recently, it's electronically controlled. So you can re really do magic tuning these things, and we're gonna talk about tuning today. Let's go and have a look at how all this stuff comes together and how you make more power or more fuel economy in racing or just towing your trailer up to the mountains. There are a lot of misconceptions about performance diesel uh, and how you make more power with a diesel. So diesel always has made better mileage than gasoline engines. The particulate or the smoke output of a diesel engine today is actually less than, with the after treatment, is less than a gasoline engine. To me, smoke is the negative legacy of diesel. I don't want to be behind a smoking diesel and I do diesel. The whole thing with smoke kind of has its uh, origin in, in tractor pulling, where big mechanical fuel injection pumps are used to just pee fuel into the engine to the extent that the smoke blots out the sun. All the guys in the Midwest equate that with power, and yes, smoke and power go together. And then we have found that we're actually making more power by burning the fuel the smoke in the engine, so there is no smoke and more power. I started out supercharging engines in the late 50s for boats, and these were gasoline engines, and they would detonate or knock. When you got the compression ratio and the cylinder temperature up to a level that the spark plug fires and then it auto ignites somewhere else in the combustion chamber and gives you such a pressure and heat input into the piston that it kills the pistons, that's your limit. The octane of the fuel, the higher the number, the greater the detonation uh, threshold. In other words, you can push on the engine harder with higher octane and not have it detonate. Conversely, diesel engines literally run on detonation, so to speak. It's auto-ignited. In other words, the piston comes up on the compression stroke and compresses the air in the cylinder to such a high temperature that when you inject the fuel, it instantaneously goes off. No spark plug and no detonation. As Long as you stay within the thermal limits and the physical limits of a diesel engine, you have no fuel problem. 
The point is you, you want to get complete combustion in cylinder. You want to minimize the high exhaust temperature that's associated with smoke. So clean tune is our thing. So on the, on the subject of diesel fuel, there's lots of stuff out there. Uh, Biodiesel, you hear a lot about, t takes a couple of different forms. One of them I call greasel. It's kind of made from French fry grease or what have you. There's no regulation of the quality of this stuff. That's the first problem. Then you've got professionally done biodiesel. Yes, there is a standard. Uh, and a majority of companies that are making biodiesel adhere to that standard. And you'll find biodiesel in blends uh, that are acceptable to the uh, fuel injection manufacturers up to about 20% or what they call B20. That's 20% bio, 80% conventional diesel fuel. Diesel fuel has undergone some improvements to make it more emissions friendly by pulling down uh, the sulfur content in the fuel to an extremely low level and improving the lubricity of the fuel so everything will last longer. When we've set all of our re records with diesel, like when we went to Bonneville and, and went 217 with the Cummins-powered Dakota pickup, which, oh, by the way, towed its trailer there with the, all the service gear in it and the race parts, we bought the fuel to run at that event at a truck stop right where you go onto the salt flats. One of the things that people have asked me through the years is, if it, the power was available, why isn't the factory doing it? Usually it has to do with cost, uh, but we've always been conscious from those very early 6.2 liter engines, such as in the Humvee, of where the limits are. So we take an engine, put it in our engine dyno cells, and we find the limits engine speed, engine temperature, those sorts of things, cylinder pressure, which we measure in the cylinder, to see where the engine fails. When we come up with a tuning package, we stay within the limits of the engine, what I call the performance envelope. Same with the powertrain. A lot of uh, torque output from a really enhanced diesel pickup engine uh, it's awfully hard on the powertrain if it's not applied properly. So we look at the application of torque and staying within the design of the transmission. In some cases, we make a thing called a trans command that electronically beefs up the transmission, gives it higher line pressure under a heavy load so it won't slip. Same with a torque converter clutch. So let's go uh, have a look at some engines and some turbos and some intercoolers. To talk about the airflow through a diesel engine. Air ultimately, the air mass, the pounds of air per minute that you, you can induct and force into the intake ports determines the power potential of a diesel engine or any engine for that matter, gasoline or otherwise. Engines as they spin, a four-stroke displaces its own volume, like this is a 5.9 liter Cummins diesel engine. Every two revolutions, it displaces 5.9 liters of air. If you want more air, you can turn the engine faster, but that ultimately has a limit and really isn't practical in a work truck or something like that. So what can we do to, to en enhance the performance of the diesel engine in a truck or in a car? The major thing is improve the air mass flow, improve the air density, the pounds per thousand cubic feet. Where does the air start? Where, where do you get the air from? Well, certainly not under the hood. Well, why not under the hood? You've seen these old hot rods with open element air cleaners under the hood? The fact is that the temperature under, under the hood is killing the air density. So each cubic foot you pump doesn't have as much air mass can't make as much power. So the best place to, to get the air is to inhale air that you're driving through 
which we're doing through this scoop that goes under the front fascia on the Dodge Cummins or Ram Cummins pickup. That cold ram air, the faster you go, the more it's rammed in. So you're getting the coolest possible air. And secondly, it's got a little boost pressure already, kind of like a poor man's supercharger or turbo. Then you take it into ducting, which has minimum drag or loss through a filter, which has minimum pressure loss. So you're trying to maintain that pressure and get, get that cold air all the way to the turbocharger with minimum restriction and minimum pressure loss. Once it goes through the turbocharger, the turbocharger compresses it. In other words, it packs more air into each cubic foot. By increasing its pressure, that increases its air density. Boost pressure, temperature, and the humidity of the day all affect the air density. And that's what you're after here, the highest possible air density. But when you compress it, you heat it. So it's not as dense as it can be. Yeah, it's better. It's compressed. Now we go through an intercooler. And the design of the inlet air tank and the outlet air tank is kind of a scientific thing. You've got this huge radiator. It's radiating heat from the air passing through it to the outside air running through the nose of the vehicle. We do two things when we design an intercooler. Minimize restriction. And we do that by more thickness, more height if possible, more width if possible, basically giving you more area to radiate heat and less restriction, so less pressure drop going through this thing. There will be a boost loss going through one of these things, but the air will be denser. So a boost gauge that measured at the outlet would tell you, gee, you've lost some boost compared to what's coming out of the compressor but you've gained density. So it's kind of counterintuitive to guys who talk boost all their lives, and I'm one of them, to think that, gee, I lost some boost, but I'm gaining power. But that's how the world works. The air is now more dense and exits out. And in this case, what we've done is we've increased the size of the outlet and the inlet, so there's minimum loss in the piping. It's all about maintaining as much pressure as you can while cooling the air. In this case, we come out with, with a very large four inch discharge pipe. We cut the stock intake manifold off the cylinder head and we replace it with a casting of our own, which allows us to go in and port the cylinder head and put bigger valves, etc. Now we have to have the appropriate amount of fuel to be injected with the air. So that can be done a number of ways. One way, which is very popular, is what we call an economind. It's it's a black box and its wire loom it goes in line with a stock wire loom on the engine and it allows you to change the levels of power or fuel efficiency while you're driving the vehicle, while you're underway. One thing about diesels is they require a pretty high boost level. This is the force part of forced induction. This is forcing that pressure, forcing that higher density air around the intake valve and into the cylinder. Diesels require swirl, so the valve the ports are somewhat restrictive to get this swirling air entering the chamber. Hence, to get the same sort of power you would with a gasoline turbo engine, you're probably at a much higher boost than you would be with a gasoline turbo engine. Out of the turbocharger and down to the emissions equipment and ultimately to your tailpipe tip, you, you, you've got another uh, opportunity to gain some power, to gain some engine life, and to gain fuel efficiency by reducing back pressure. And what that does, when the piston comes up the bore, pushing out the spent gases on the exhaust stroke, it goes through the turbine on the turbocharger and then into the resistance of the exhaust system. Energy from the crankshaft is pushing that piston up to push against that back pressure. If you reduce the back pressure, diminish the parasitic load on the crankshaft, you get more power on the same fuel, uh, or you can make the same power with less fuel. Either way, it's a power or fuel efficiency thing. So the exhaust system, uh, very, very low restriction. That's the way to go. I, ideally, people ask about, doesn't a turbocharger need some back pressure? The answer is absolutely not. You want 
no back pressure whatsoever after the turbocharger. That give, gives you the most efficient engine setup. Okay, so there you have it. We've walked the air through the diesel engine. The same techniques apply to diesel-powered cars, uh, trucks, boats, it doesn't matter. It's all about airflow efficiency and intelligent fuel injection. Everything else has to do with safety. In other words, keeping the system so that the vehicle and the engine and transmission are durable.